and uh, Koto Katoa. It's um, wonderful to be here at um, the first, I feel honored to be at the first Scabies Symposium in New Zealand. Um, it's fun describing to my colleagues where I was dashing off to and they were all kind of intrigued. And um, really, anyone here who listened to Daniel's presentation would realize why we are here. Um, and that was an absolutely brilliant overview. And obviously, um, I don't, I'm not going to be going into Scabies in any detail at all. But it is just great to be here and having this focus. So I'm really going to be talking about some of the evidence around skin infections and particularly rheumatic fever. And just want to really, um, I've got a few colleagues who contribute to the presentation of big group actually. I don't know if this is, um, do I have to do anything to make this advance? Oh. <laughs> Hello. 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 And, uh, so what I'm going to talk about a bit is the epidemiology of ARF. And I guess that's one of the big drivers in the museum context about, and obviously Simon Thornley's work has really put this on the map in New Zealand. Um, and obviously looking at the epidemiology is quite helpful for thinking about whether scabies is in the causal pathway. Um, I'm going to present really three strands of evidence around the role of skin infection. All of these results are still provisional because they're in various stages of publication and review. And then, what does all this mean for the museum context, particularly, and I'm really coming at this from particularly the perspective of acute rheumatic fever. So, I think many of you know that gas, or group A strep, strep A, is certainly a bacteria that we should be very concerned about. It has so many manifestations. And today, and you've already heard a bit about, um, I guess, impetigo pyoderma, and obviously pharyngitis as the superficial infections, a range of other severe consequences. And then, particularly today, we're thinking about the post-streptococcal um, effects, you know, acute rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, and acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which I'm not really going to say much about. So, um, uh, in terms of um, looking at the epidemiology, New Zealand has, a, obviously, a lot of data on um, administrative data, which can help us look at the epidemiology of things like ARF and RHD. Uh, there's still a lot of issues around how you interpret coding, particularly for rheumatic heart disease. So I'm just going to comment briefly on um, the epidemiology. So ARF is still a relatively rare disease in New Zealand, so around 160 cases a year. And it's gone up and down over the years, there has been a recent dip as a result, I think, of the uh, huge, intense focus on um, the school-based program for treating um, gas pharyngitis. Um, if we look at the distribution of ARF, it's quite remarkable, and I'm sure most of you who know anything about rheumatic fever in the room know how it has this almost perfect bell-shaped curve centered around the age of 10 or 12 years of age. It doesn't really occur under four, or very rarely, and probably after the age of 20 or 19 or 20, these are predominantly recurrent cases rather than new cases. There's nothing else that has that distribution that I know of in terms of that epidemiology. So, uh, and this is, I think, the slide which um, I still find um, a huge concern in New Zealand, the massive increase in inequities in this, in this disease. And this is looking at rates in those under 20 years of age. So if you like, it's an age-specific rate. And you can see how the disease basically vanished in uh, European and Asian children. Uh, there's maybe a slight dip recently in Maori children and the rates continuing to climb in Pacific children in New Zealand. I think it's very fitting that we are bringing that we're looking at the Pacific perspective with scabies as well. This is another um, one of those descriptive slides looking at uh, average rates over the last 20 years again in the under 20 year olds. And you can see that it's a disease of poverty, you know, of NZ dip 9, 10, so the poorest 20% of neighbourhoods having higher rates. But it's also a disease that's very patterned by ethnicity and all the things that go with that. So just looking at the, uh, even though we talk about ARF, actually the reason we're trying to prevent ARF is to prevent this, rheumatic heart disease. And this is showing the average number of cases per year. And again, it's not a, a huge number of cases, but this disease obviously carries huge consequences for those that are affected with um, shortened lifespan and really alteration in activities 
and long-term medication and surgical treatment. If we look at mortality, it's a slightly better picture. Mortality is declining, and again, it's um, in older age groups, not surprisingly. So the first bit of evidence I want to talk about is a national case control study, and uh, it involved um, a large group of collaborators, and I really want to again acknowledge Professor Diana Lennon, who was a leading uh, contributor to the field of rheumatic fever and other childhood diseases in New Zealand, who died suddenly last year. Uh, and this is um, the purpose of the study, the goal of the study was to really look at um, modifiable risk factors for rheumatic fever. And we conceptualize these really at two stages. The proximal risk factors, which could be skin infection or throat infection or scabies, and the more distal factors, all of these determinants. And we looked at it in this way. Um, we've obviously got socioeconomic drivers up here, which we know from the descriptive data. We don't need to do any more research on this to know that uh, poverty is a huge driver of um, ARF. But we wanted to look at what are some of these intermediate pathways that are contributing. And some of these are modifiable. And down here, of course, we've got certain fixed host factors and certain organism factors. But this is really the, the, the trinity of um, organism, host, and environment factors that we want to look at. And we're particularly focused on these environmental factors. So this had approximately 120 cases and three controls, uh, matched controls for each case. And most of the data was gathered by a questionnaire administered face-to-face -face, um, with some biological specimens collected. And then you see now we can link. There's a huge amount of linkable data, which is very helpful for these kind of studies. So looking at the risk factors, and the way I'm just presenting these in the next few slides is looking at the prevalence of that particular exposure in the cases and the controls in there in yellow, and then this conditional adjusted odds ratio, which is adjusted for all of the matching variables. And so it's comparing the case with its three matched controls, so it's a conditional analysis. So as you can see here, um, not surprisingly, uh, a much higher proportion of cases report a sore throat in the preceding four weeks than control. So that was really not um, a surprise at all. So the results that are more relevant to this meeting are those that reported a skin infection. And they had a show card of um, a range of impetigo type infections. And again, uh, this exposure was much more common in the cases in the controls, but, but less common than um, pharyngitis, or a sore throat, I should say. Now, if we stratify by whether they had a, a, a sore throat as well, you can see that the effect largely disappears. But if you had both a throat infection and a skin infection, we saw this very high odds ratio. Looking at scabies, and uh, again, we, this, this is self-reported. We had a show card. Um, we know, we've heard about the difficulty of, of um, diagnosing this disease. And this is showing the prevalence of this um, uh, of positive answer to this question for cases and controls. So this is giving some idea of the prevalence, and the background prevalence in this population. But admittedly, these are already Maori and Pacific children in um, highly deprived neighborhoods. So it's not a um, representative population, but it is, it is an indication of prevalence. And here you can see the prevalence of this exposure is much higher in cases, and a, high, um, uh, a highly significant um, odds ratio. If we stratify by um, with or without a throat infection, it doesn't have any effect on this relationship, so it does appear to be independent of a history of recent throat infection. Um, we looked at a, whole other, a lot of other um, fairly predictable risk factors, particularly household crowding, and this is all in relation to uh, rheumatic fever, of course, rather than scabies. And again, um, every uh, measure we used of, uh, of household crowding, including um, linked um, data based on the floor area of the house, um, had showed highly significant relationships with the risk of ARF. Um, bed sharing was also um, a risk factor, and also hot bedding, where there's so much pressure on some families that 
um, other members are having to share the bed but use it in sequence. And every other measure we use of what you call extreme housing deprivation also showed very strong relationships with ARF. Housing tenure, again, um, a strong relationship and um, self-assessed poor housing quality. Um, we had a standard set of questions for looking at damp and mould and, and cold and all of the, um, the composite measure of um, household damp and mould again showed a highly significant relationship and um, a less significant relationship with uh, four standard questions of um, cold um, in the house and difficulty heating. Another area we were interested in is um, the availability of um, washing facilities and we produced this composite of two questions about really a form of fuel poverty if you like, not having enough um, hot water in the house, so sometimes having to take a cold or lukewarm bath or shower or having to put off having a bath or shower and that again were related to, to risk. Um, one of the surprises was we, we were not that focused on nutritional factors in this study. We included standard um, questions from the New Zealand, um, the New Zealand Health Survey. And um, one that really um, was highly significant was um, sugar sweetened drinks. Um, and that was again associated with risk. Um, elevated BMI, I mean internationally, um, low birth weight, low weight is often uh, malnutrition is linked to ARF in some studies. That's the form of malnutrition in New Zealand arguably now is having an elevated BMI and that was again related to risk. And the strongest single risk factor is a family history of rheumatic fever. So when we put this into the multivariate model, as you know a lot of your risk factors disappear and of course this is a bit of an art as well as a science of what factors you do put in the model. But we found that family history was the single most important or that had the largest um, effect and also strong effect from household crowding and more marginal effects from uh, other, uh, another uh, household um, factor and uh, limited hot water and this still remained as a, as a very significant risk factor. So one of the other things we did, and this is really, um, we're very fortunate to have Nikki Morland here, who is um, a wonderful immunologist, and uh, this is what she did to compare the cases and controls according to evidence of previous gas infection. And this is really testing the hypothesis about priming. It may be that the risk factors don't operate in that four weeks preceding ARF, which is the, the kind of normal interval you'd expect. A lot of these factors may operate through your first five years of life before you even can get ARF. And so it may be this cumulative effect of a very poor environment and scabies exposure and skin infections and a whole lot of things that basically prime your immune system so that one more exposure in that sensitive age group tips you over into having this um, harmful pathological response. And I think her data does provide a lot of support for that, comparing cases and controls, and this is a very, uh, quite a complex analysis that looks at all of your collective immune memory um, for previous gas exposures, and this is comparing controls um, and their matched cases, uh, or cases and their matched controls. And uh, this is, you can see there's a highly significantly higher number of reactivities in cases compared with controls. And this applies if you stratify by age, even at the age of you know, between five and nine, it's already, that effect is already quite apparent. So when we put all this together, um, I think the, the risk factors for ARF, we, we can see some of these are, are prob probably not that surprising. Some evidence of multiple exposures to, to group A strep, increased household crowding, um, damp, poor housing conditions, and maybe inadequate water for washing, possibly some nutritional factors. And the precipitating event, it looks like it can be gas pharyngitis and probably also scabies and possibly also skin infections. So this is another study um, that I think also adds some evidence to this <laughs> hypothesis and this is, um, was done with a couple of our students and this is um, really looking at this question here about, we know gas strep, uh, a gas uh, pharyngitis causes rheumatic fever or initiates it, and so on. Gas skin infection is linked to glomerulonephritis, 
But these other relationships are still quite contested. So basically, we took advantage of New Zealand's amazing linked data and um, uh, co-investigator lab tests in Auckland to give us access um, to, um, with record linkage, to around um, one and a half million um, throat and skin swabs. And we looked at these outcomes using linked data and coded events. We also looked at, at pharmaceutical data for antibiotic dispensing. And one of the first things um, we did, of course, you can look at um, the prevalence of gas in a throat swab. And this is a, for different, different ethnic groups and different age groups. And I know that it does jiggle up and down a bit, but one of the things that's quite striking is that across different ethnic groups and age groups, it's quite consistent that it's around, in this range, heading up to around 15% of the swabs are positive. And we actually would have expected much more variability because if you imagine that it's gas exposure and gas meningitis is mediating some of these ethnic differences, we might expect to see more variation, but we're not seeing it there. But when you go, when you look at gas infection of the skin, it's a completely different picture. And here you can see that across all of these age bands, but particularly in those under five, we see almost 50% or even more than 50% of skin swaps from skin infections are gas positive and much lower proportion in, and that's for Marian Pacific, much lower in Asian and European and others. So the thing that really, this is so striking um, is that this is starting to give a signal for how, or one of the ways in which the ethnic inequalities are being mediated with this disease, which we don't see with gas pharyngitis. So this is the thing we actually started out to do, was to look at what happens in the few months after you've had a gas-positive throat or skin swab. And this is looking um, based on around um, 1.2 million swabs. We split them into the 15 or so percent that were gas-positive <coughs> and compared them with the other almost 80 percent that were gas-negative. And we looked at what is your um, risk of ARF um, in um, different time windows. And you can see it doesn't really change much if, you're, if you had a gas negative throat swab, but it rises and not unexpectedly um, in this period here to about 0.1% of um, gas positive infections are progressing to ARF in that time window. So one we're really interested, when you look at this for skin infection, you see something very similar that um, there's not much change in the gas negatives, but the gas positives show a, a peak risk, which is of the same order as for gas pharyngitis, at around 0.1% progression. And so we also looked at this with, um, uh, with um, uh, glomerulonephritis. I'm not going to talk about that. We found that this tended to suggest, as I was saying, that gas skin infections are also uh, maybe a trigger for acute rheumatic fever. We found a very strong relationship with glomerulonephritis, which is what we expected, but we didn't find any relationship between gas pharyngitis and glomerulonephritis, which is the conventional wisdom. And group CG streptococci are less common, and there was no association there with um, risk of progression. So um, these are some of the, I guess, summarising those findings, we think um, that it does support, it does show ethnic differences in, in, in skin infection uh, with that exposure. It does show this progression risk of about 0.1% per gas infection across both of these sites. Interestingly, when we linked in antibiotic dispensing, it had no effect on your risk of progression from gas pharyngitis. So oral moxicillin prescriptions had no relationship at all to what happened to you subsequently. Uh, so gas, as a cause of um, ARF, this is a study that's underway at present. We're still collecting um, data on this. And this is um, looking at a thousand children in Auckland. Um, we've recruited almost all of them now. And this is looking at 800 who visited healthcare because of a sore throat or a skin infection. And it was it used lab-based data. And we're comparing, um, they were divided into these four groups here. But we're particularly interested in these two groups of gas-positive throat swabs and gas-positive uh, skin infections, and we also had a negative. <coughs> At the same time, 
We also sampled differently from across the Auckland Isthmus uh, an asymptomatic population. So these are just the initial findings. It's we're about 90% there or 95%. And we just had a quick look at the findings. And what it's showing is that there is a response that we can classify as seroconversion or seropositivity um, in about 70% of children after a, a gas-positive throat culture and similar in a gas-positive skin culture. Um, there's a lot of details in there about, I mean, we're using a mixture of, um, uh, because they had acute and convalescent um, specimens arise in a true seroconversion. Most, all we've got is a, um, uh, a single, uh, the acute specimen is also an elevated um, um, marker, so um, they'll always be a little less certain, but certainly they meet the criteria for recent infection. So that's all I can really say about that at the moment, but again, I think it adds weight to the idea that um, skin infection is also a potential initiator, or at least a priming exposure. So, so I think when you put all this together, uh, I think there's a pretty convincing argument that gas skin infection is an important uh, in the, um, the development of um, ARF um, in New Zealand. And uh, again, I think um, there's also an association with, with scabies independent of other infections. And really, we, we don't know the role, relative importance of priming exposures versus these acute exposures. Obviously, most of the data I'm presenting here is about the consequences of an acute exposure, but priming is something that's very hard to measure. You could design a study, probably. It'll be a very intensive longitudinal study, I think. So what does all this mean? I think, um, I know we're not focusing on ARF, but I think um, there are a lot of messages from this work, and I think um, building on other people's work that We've got to improve our distal factors, determinants, improving housing conditions, benefits, so many, there's so many benefits, and this is just one to add to the list. This is the area where we've got to really um, focus, I think, um, <coughs> thinking about gas infection treatment at a, pro at a population level is where I think we do need to change what we're doing. And there's a whole lot of issues around managing disease. So, uh, just to really amplify that, there's a lot of things we can do to improve that, the home environment of children. Obviously, the housing market is a very tough thing, as we've watched the government, with good intentions, it's still a huge struggle to have an adequate supply of affordable, suitable housing. Uh, it doesn't seem too much to say a bed for every child. And uh, all of these measures to create a sustained improvement in housing quality are important. And elements of fuel poverty, I mean, one of the most expensive aspects of um, uh, energy expenditure in the home is water heating, and that's clearly, uh, unfortunately, a, um, an optional expense for some families. Not optional, they just can't afford to do it. Um, this is an area where I think we really need to um, improve what we're doing. Um, our whole approach to the population approach to gas infection management um, on the basis of this study, I think we could probably move towards a far more targeted approach based on family history, a more far now centered model. Um, I'm not really talking about the efficacy of antibiotics, but we will be looking at it in the current study. But I think the arguments for injectable penicillin are pretty strong, and this is some other alternative. Um, I think the focus on skin infection is very justifiable and scabies, and I'm, I just love the idea that we've got another potentially eradicable um, in human infection um, with scabies. Oh, there are a lot of other things we can do better with ARF, including uh, better management of children who've had the disease. And ultimately, we, we do need more evidence-informed, co-designed, um, integrated programs. And there is, we recently had a meeting, a really good meeting here on, on acute rheumatic fever, and a lot of support. Um, John was, John Malcolm was there, and many others, several others in this room, I think. Um, having a far more integrated, I mean, we're a small country, we should be able to get this right in terms of having a far more integrated, cohesive approach to rheumatic fever management and prevention. There's quite a bit of research underway, and um, uh, including some joint with Australia, and I think it's a real strength to work with Australia. We've got many common issues. Um, and I would like to see us move towards 
I mean, there's nothing like the power of controlled trials or even high-quality observational studies around interventions. And I think we should be doing these things now because they take quite a long time, quite complex. So as soon as we start, the better. Hopefully, there's time to discuss that today. And uh, just want to acknowledge uh, a number of funders and a huge number of um, people who've assisted with this research. Thanks.